Good morning. If you are visiting with us for the first time, my name is Edgar Mama. And I'm bringing God's word to us today. In the past few decades, people and society have become increasingly impatient. We want quick answers to complex problems, the quest for justice, the economy, diseases, and personal relationships. So people speed date, eat fast food, use the self-checkout lines in grocery stores, pay extra for overnight shipping, honk even when the, when the lights on green, speak, speak in half sentences, and text in shorthand. No wonder a study in, done in 2000 recorded that the average human attention span is only 12 seconds. That number since has dropped to 8 seconds. That is one second less than that of a goldfish. <laughs> With such a relentless pursuit of instant gratification and solutions in our society, it is not surprising that virtues like patience, perseverance, and steadfastness is in short supply, especially when people are faced with suffering and or experience any other form of adversity. However, James reminds us that believers are called to stand out and model a different standard that is countercultural and distinct from the impatient society around us. In other words, our faith in Christ should shape our responses to suffering and adversity. Would you please join me in prayer as we explore what James has to teach us this morning. Father, we thank you for your word that is before us. As we sound just now, teach us, O oh Lord, and give us attitudes that will receive your eternal words of truth with humility. We pray in Jesus' name. So we are reading from, we, we are in our series in James chapter 5. I'm going to be speaking from chapter 5, 7 to 12. Please turn to James chapter 5, 7 to 12, and we'll read. James 5, 7 to 12. The scripture reads, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath. But let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. James introduced this section of his writing with a conjunction, therefore, indicating that this section is to be understood in light of the previous verses, verse 1 to verse 6, where he addressed the rich and pow powerful for taking advantage of the righteous poor and underprivileged believers. His overarching goal was to encourage these hopeless Christians to remain steadfast 
by patiently, by, we may step by patiently enduring such treatments in the light of the Lord's coming. When the righteous judge will come and reign vengeance upon the rich and powerful wicked. We will go through this text in three movements. The first is endure suffering with patience. We'll see that from verse 9, verse 7 to 9. And the second movement here is going to be exemplars of patience in suffering, verse 10 to 11. And finally, the last is elements of integrity of speech while you suffer. We'll see that in verse 12. This morning, I hope to convince you all that Christians should endure suffering with patience and steadfastness as we wait for the coming of the Lord. That is my goal, to, to convince us, to argue this out, that as Christians, we should endure suffering with patience and steadfastness as we wait for the coming of the Lord. The first movement, endure suffering with patience, 7 to 9. From the reading of the text, we could infer that in light of the economic abuses James's readers were experiencing, it was tempting for them to despair or lose hope, just like most people would in the face of unabated adversities. We tend to be angry, bitter, and frustrated. But James figuratively put his arm around them and gently nudged them with these four words. Be patient, therefore, brothers. This is both a command and an encouragement. The command is, be patient, therefore. And it appealed to the believers to tolerate suffering with patience and not become angry or bitter. However, James' command was not said callously. He fully understood the plight of these believers. He did not dismiss them, what they were going through, with a befitting religious advice as we tend to treat people who suffer around us. Either by our words or by our attitudes. You may have heard comments like this. God does not give us any load we cannot carry. Or just hang in there. He will see you through. Or I'll be praying for you. While there's, there are truths in such comments, some people use it as a pretense either to dismiss the person or don't want to be bothered by their suffering. But see how James immediately followed that command with the endearing word here, brothers. Brothers. This indicates that James was not merely addressing them from an intellectual perspective, he, but he identified himself with them in the abuse as fellow suffering believer. In other words, he did not dismiss their mistreatment that they suffered in the hands of their oppressors. But encouraging someone to cope with their pain and suffering isn't always the difficult part. The real difficulty comes when responding to their lingering question of why me? Or in other words, or in the words of David, how long do I have to go through this in Psalm 13? So James addressed the why and how long in the next half of the sentence. He says, until the coming of the Lord. I strongly believe this is the main emphasis of the entire passage. Everything else James would tell them was hinged upon the notion that they were called to endure suffering with patience and steadfastness in light of the Lord's coming. 
In other words, he encouraged them to live with a strong conviction and confidence assurance in the coming of the Lord in such a way that it profoundly shaped the outlook of their prevailing circumstances. That's James' goal. Be patient, brothers. This truth is equally important for us today when we suffer trials. But the truth be told, patience is one of the hardest virtues to cultivate, especially in the face of trials and crises, because waiting is not the default setting of any one of us. We all lack the perfect ability to steadfastly wait without loss of favor. To this end, David Gibson, one author, says, The greatest problem we often have in our suffering is a poor grasp of who we are waiting for and where he is while we are waiting for him. When we lose sight of this, the burden of our pain and suffering intensifies proportionately to the level of our impatience. Have you noticed that? The burden does not go away when you worry. It only intensifies. So when you are impatient, the problem does not go away. It only doubles. Hence, we revert to the bedeviling questions of why, Lord? How is this possible? Why me? Or where are you, Lord? James answers all of these questions by pointing us to the north star of his argument. He reminds us why Christians should exercise spirit-empowered patience in their suffering. Listen, because the Lord Jesus will certainly return. And to set all things right. And punish all oppressors and their work of iniquity. That is why James says, wait patiently under these trials. Brothers, wait. James illustrates patience and suffering by describing the farmer's patience in verse 7b. It reads, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. His reference to the farmer's patience in waiting for the fruit of the earth without any ability to manipulate the climatic conditions to speed up the early rain or the late rains was easily relatable. His audience knew that they were, they, 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 they were farmers. They were agrarian culture. And so James says, look at them. Look at the farmer. Although farmers have no control over when the rains will fall, they, re, they remain confident that they will. So they plow their fields in anticipation of the early rains for their crop to grow. In the meantime, the farmer does not just wait aimlessly. No, he waits with reasonable hope and expectation of a reward for his hard work. Depending on things out of his own control, he waits with anticipation of the value of his harvest at the end of the season. Despite the changing circumstances and many uncertainties, he waits. No matter how long it takes, he waits. He does not give up waiting. Because to give up is to lose hope. And that's not what farmers do. They wait. So James says, you see that? That's what hopeful perseverance or enduring patience in suffering looks like. Therefore, he says, therefore, you also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Just like a farmer has no control over when the rains will fall, but confidently waits for it. Such is the disposition James implores all of us believers to emulate as we wait for the coming of the Lord. How does this relate to your current 
situation? Are you in a season of pain and suffering? Are you grieving the loss of a child, parent, spouse, friend, or any loved one? What about the outcome of your most recent medical exam, which did not go well? Are you struggling with a burden that seems to drain you spiritually, emotionally, physically, and perhaps economically? Maybe yours is an abusive relationship you have had to endure. Or maybe you have been battling a spell of depression that won't lift. Are you suffering under an overbearing boss who is painfully oppressing you, perhaps just because of your Christian conviction? Or does your suffering come from a colleague at work who, continues, who is continuously telling false rumors about you? What about have you been robbed of peace by a contentious neighbor who is directing mean laws at you? Or are you just simply distraught by all the chaos and moral decadence around you, around us in society, that your prayer is now, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, come. Despite all these personal and painful experiences on this side of Eden, James lovingly says, Be patient, therefore, brothers and sisters, like the farmer. Wait for the early and late rains. But even more than that, he wants us to patiently endure those sufferings in light of the Lord's coming. The righteous judge who is not only in charge of everything, but will one day restore the bliss of the lost Eden with perfect peace, righteousness, and justice. Therefore, James calls upon his readers to establish their heart. Because trials tend to expose us to the temptation of being lured away from wholehearted devotion to the Lord. And when this happens, patience and endurance becomes difficult. When you take your eyes off from the Lord, it's difficult to endure. I learned this many years ago. That the best way to live daily with such awareness and patiently endure trials is to take one day at a time. And I mean literally one day at a time, trusting God for each day. Just take just one day. Do not worry about tomorrow. Just take one day at a time, trusting God for each day. This calls for willful embracing of God's purposes and plan just for that day, just for today. Let him worry about tomorrow just for today. However, I don't mean a mere stoica embracing of suffering as a show of strength. No, rather it is a Holy Spirit-empowered confidence and trust in the Lord that he would accomplish his purposes and plans for your life beyond what you can ever hope for. James moves on to another command in verse 9. I believe this is one of the most common but deadly disposition believers engage in when they experience hardship. It is a confidence, hope, and faith killer. And that vice is a temptation of grumbling. To grumble against God or against one another. We saw how the sin of grumbling and complaining aroused the anger of the Lord against the Israelites in the wilderness in Numbers 11 and 14. Verse 1 reads of 11. Now the people complain about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard this, he heard them, his anger was aroused. A fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. By the way, grumbling or complaining should not be confused 
with biblical lament. There are two different things. Lament is a form of prayer in which we make our desperate petitions known to God in recognition of His sovereignty, in anticipation of His help to come to our rescue. God wants you and me to do that. But complaining and grumbling, on the other hand, stem from a place of distrust, doubt, and unbelief in God's sovereign purpose. So the Israelites were judged because of their grumbling, because they demean God's power. Quickly, the second uh, movement here, we'll be brief on this one, verse 10 to 11, exemplars of patience in suffering. It was not lost on James to look to the Old Testament prophets as exemplars of patience and endurance amid suffering. Even though God loved his and honored his prophets, far too many of them suffered immensely at the hands of their own people. When the people did not like the message from God, instead of repenting and seeking mercy from God, they turned on the prophets. Take the prophet Jeremiah, for example. He was not called the weeping prophet for no reason. He was known for speaking out against the wickedness of his time. He boldly spoke against the worship of Israel, the worship of, uh, of Israel the false worship of Israel and Israel's lack of trust in Yahweh. And on many occasions predicted the looming destruction of the nation of Israel. Hence, he was also called the prophet of doom because he boldly proclaimed God's judgment against the sins of the people. And these monikers of weeping prophet and prophet of doom led to considerable mistreatment in the hands of his own people. However, as Paul described in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to, so to teach them what their itching ears want to hear. Unlike many modern-day preachers, the prophets did not pander to such clamor by telling the people what their itching ears wanted to hear. Rather, they remained faithful to the Lord and his message of righteousness, sin, and judgment, even at the risk of enduring persecution. For instance, the prophet Jeremiah, who was kind of a typology of Christ in sorrow and grief, was beaten and put in stocks in Jeremiah 20 verse 2. He was thrown into prison in Jeremiah 32 verse 2 and lowered into a dungeon. We see that in Jeremiah 38 verse 6. Still, he continued to proclaim the message of the Lord faithfully. Amid many persecutions, affliction, malignment, and danger of death, Jeremiah, like many other Old Testament prophets, were patient in trial. They did not give up. But what better, what better illustration there is to the commitment and devotion to patience in suffering than our Lord Jesus himself on the cross when he was facing the cross. But that's the reason he came. Isaiah 53 reminds us of his famous text in Isaiah 53. Verse 3 says, He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain like one from whom people hid their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishments that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. In verse 11 of chapter 5 of James, he turns to another icon of patient endurance and suffering, the old sage Job. He was well known for his steadfast 
sickness amid severe testing from the Lord. During those extreme tests, Job's friends tormented him unsuccessfully into false admission that he had sinned against God. Despite being tempted to give up, he remained steadfast. His story ended with a happy ending of great blessing and material wealth. But I can promise you that, that every story ends with a happy ending. At least on this side of Eden right now. But one thing that is sure, that he is coming to restore all things. And on that other side, it's going to be okay. It's going to be good. It's going to be fine. Why? Because even the text as we read here shows us that he is a compassionate and merciful judge. That is King Jesus himself. So what mistreatment are you enduring? Patiently wait for the coming of the Lord is at hand. What painful trials are you called to bear right now? Patiently wait with hope in, with hopeful endurance until the Lord returns. What injustice or miscarriage of justice have you encountered? Friends, patiently wait with courage for the coming of the Lord is at hand. What persecution are you facing because of your faith? I dare say, patiently wait, steadfastly wait, for the Lord is coming. Or what guilt and shame are you dealing with due to your, the consequences of your sinful past? Rejoice, for the compassionate and merciful one has dealt away with that, and you no longer stand condemned, no longer he has set you free. Finally, the elements of integrity, of speech, and suffering. We see this in verse 12. I must admit he right here that this verse is the troublesome one at first glance. Why is that so? Because you do not, we do not see how logically it flows in the previous text or the succeeding text. It almost looks like cut and dry, discreet, dropped in here. So at first glance, it looks like it's hard to see how this relates. However, a deep dive into the text and considering the nuance of the theme of the section, which is a call on all believers to endure suffering with patience and steadfastness in light of the Lord's coming, we begin to see how it fits into the discourse. The verse begins with the phrase, but above all. And to the English reader, this may sound like James was emphasizing this point as the most seminal point, the most crucial point. However, this is not how his original readers understood it, because that's not what James intended. It was only a style of writing. The ancient Greeks would write like this in correspondences or speech to say, above all, as a transitional phrase, like we will say today to wrap things up in conclusion. So when you see above all, it's not saying this is the point I was trying to make here, although even though it's important as well. The command following that phrase is, My brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth, or by any other, or by any other oath. If you are wondering how swearing relates to the preceding or following verses, I strongly believe that James was appealing to soundness of speech and integrity of speech in light of his appeal to his readers to endure suffering. And be patient. You know, integrity of speech is more often challenged in times of suffering than in times of convenience. The integrity of our speech is challenged in the times that we suffer. As the saying goes, someone's true character is revealed in adversity. That's when you know 
who they truly are. When we suffer, we may say things out of frustration and anger that we don't mean. That's when we tend to speak quickly and rashly to and about others. That's when we make vows to God that we don't keep. That's when we erroneously blame others for our woes when we suffer in all of this. So James reminds us to examine our speech in such circumstances to take it seriously. And this admonition echoes what Jesus himself said in Matthew 5.34, warning his listeners and you know, someone on the mount. Right? But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all. All you need to say is simple and simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the devil, from the evil one, rather. That is why James sees a great danger of sinning in our speech when our faith is tried by suffering or injustice. We could be tempted to protect ourselves through deceptive or presumptuous speech. Haven't you heard or maybe you, you yourself have made such a rash vow to God? Lord, if you deliver me, I will do this. I would do A, B, C, and D. How did that go? Did you fulfill your vow to God? James says we should avoid making any of such oaths. He calls on all believers to have endurance of faith, of heart, and integrity of speech when the pressures of life lead us to despair. In place of swearing to make our words believable, James says, and Jesus also teaches to always let our words be truthful and forthright, period. Just say the truth. And that's it. Almost 30 years ago, I went through a life and death in interrogation by guerrilla forces during the civil war in my native Sierra Leone. As they were on the verge of executing me, these verses dawned on me to remain truthful in speech and steadfast in my hope in Christ, even as I faced imminent death. Well, you know that I wasn't executed, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here this morning. Just in case you were wondering, so how did I end? That's the end of the story. I wasn't. As I sat there preparing to receive a volley of bullets into my body, I felt the Holy Spirit's empowerment to endure my plight courageously. My eyes were fixed upon seeing my Lord any moment from thence. And praise God for his compassionate and uh, merciful and tender love toward me for his own glory and praise that He miraculously rescued me. And to wrap things up here, friends, what are some takeaways for us this morning? James has reminded us that our present suffering and injustices are temporary. At the glorious return of our Lord Jesus Christ, he would avenge against his foes and finally grant his people rest. However, as much as we expect the Lord's return to take vengeance upon his enemies, James urged his readers to establish their hearts in light of the coming of the Lord. And to have an established heart is not only to feed off on the the strength of the Holy Spirit to endure sufferings and struggles as we wait for the eternal resolution of all things by the righteous judge. But to relish and marvel at the compassion and mercy of Christ on those who once were his enemies, that yet he still loves them. 
Dane Otlin opines in his book, Gentle and Lowly, the heart of Christ for sinners and sufferers. That no scripture captures the heart of Christ and the gospel more than Matthew 11, 28 and 29. I love it. And you also you know it. Come unto me, all you who are weak and are heavy laden, and I will do what? And I will give you rest. But this is the part that Dane refers to. He says, Jesus says, For I am gentle and lowly in heart. I am gentle and lowly in heart. Yes, he is the judge who is to come to mete out vengeance upon his enemies. But until then, as Dane Oatland says, it describes the heart of Christ towards sinners and sufferers, that a posture that Christ right now has toward everyone is gentle. Because he wants even those who are his enemies to come unto him. And perhaps you are in that category this morning. You have not believed in him. Instead of wait for the vengeance of the Lord, for the oppression that you yourself may have met out on someone, he is calling. His heart is gentle. Come unto me. All ye who are weak and heavy laden. Friends, patience and steadfastness in suffering are vital for all Christians, not only some Christians. And being strongly convicted, convicted about the Lord's return helps cultivate steadfastness in the face of trials. Lastly, to be patient and steadfast we must strengthen our hearts in commitments to the Lord. He is coming. The king is coming with vengeance in his hands. But yet, he is inviting all those who have not yet received him to come unto him. But in the meantime, James says, endure whatever you're going through with patience. Because... He is coming. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning for speaking to all us through your word. We ask as we leave here today, Lord, no matter what we are going through, may we look upon you and learn how to be patient, how to patiently wait for you because you are coming. In Christ's name.